Um, this morning, we're very pleased to have an opportunity to speak with Professor Brian McWinney, who's our invited speaker for the Apple Lecture Series this year. And uh, this event is hosted by the TESOL and Applied Linguistics Program, and Apple stands for Applied Linguistics and Language Education Lecture Series. We're very thrilled to have this chance to speak with Professor McWinney one-on-one um, -on -one about his research, his work, and advice he has for current and future researchers in the field. And we know you have a very busy day with two talks ahead of you, so thank you so much for making your time to interview with us today. Um, before we start today, I would like to briefly introduce the speaker. And due to the time constraint and your very long list of achievements, I'm going to try to keep it brief. So Professor Brian McWinney, you're currently professor of psychology, computational linguistics, and modern languages at Carnegie Mellon University. And you've received your PhD in psycholinguistics from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, with, uh, to uh, mention some of your major achievements, with Elizabeth Bates, you've developed a model of first and second language processing and acquisition based on competition between item-based patterns. And uh, with Catherine Snow, you've also co-founded the CHILDS, the Child Language Data Exchange System project for the computational study of child language um, transcript data. Uh, your recent work includes studies of online learning of second language vocabulary and grammar, situationally embedded second language learning, neural uh, network modeling of lexical development, fMRI studies of children with vocal brain lesions, and ERP studies of between language um, competition. Uh, so Professor McWinney, thank you so much again for being uh, with us today. And to start, I would like to ask you about your journey as to how you got into the field of linguistics in general and applied linguistics in particular. And uh, your research, it includes so many facets from psycholinguistics to computational linguistics, SLA, pedagogy. So what brought you to these fields and um, what do you see as the common thread that uh, links all your diverse interests? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, you know, uh, I certainly always loved languages. <clears throat> I think I, the one language I loved the most was Latin. <laughs> I, I remember translating Cicero's uh, fourth oration against Catiline and giving that in my, uh, you know, I was a little geek, basically. You know, I was 15 years old and got into college at that age already, so, uh, was, you know, but I loved Latin. And then uh, Spanish, I, I studied, uh, I went to Spain, to Mexico, sorry, uh, and we, I was an exchange student with the son of the uh, Luis Echeverria, who was later the president of Mexico. And his, his son, Luis, who was also Luis, came to my house. So Spanish and Latin, and my father always liked German because of some German background. And then my mother's Hungarian, so a little of this, a little of that, you know, it just seemed very interesting. But, but when I went to college, I wanted to be a geologist. And uh, I actually really liked geology. And then I learned at one point that if you really want to be a geologist, you have to work for an oil company and go to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so I decided that isn't what I wanted to do. And you know, it was the 60s, so I, I, I decided I wanted to study rhetoric. So I studied rhetoric, but in the rhetoric program, they had a program called psycholinguistics, which was inside. It was called speech science. And it had some really interesting people. And that was really what got me. Uh, Bill Wong, Peter McNeilidge, um, and uh, Susan Irvin Tripp, Dan Slovin, and you know, at Berkeley there were really just a lot of interesting people. And bit by bit, I really think I got grabbed into that. And, uh, and then it was, I was really interested in learning Hungarian, which I didn't know from my mother. I mean, she spoke some, but, but really I wanted, and so I started to study Hungarian child language acquisition, actually. And that was great fun, you know, going to Hungary and playing with little kids and everything. So I think, you know, it was a little bit by bit, but uh, probably, you know, all these, each individual language, I think, has, you know, a cultural attraction, and, and you feel pulled to learning more about that culture, but you obviously have to learn the language to do that. You know, I mean, you could, I guess, learn without, but it'd be very, very incomplete. So um, I think that's probably what, what, what pulled me in. And I know when I first got a job as a psychologist, they said, are you really a psychologist? And I said, well, I do care about the mind. You know, so they said, oh, so they let me in, you know, but I think maybe, maybe I'm sort of a linguist really at heart, you know. Uh, I, I, that's, a, that's always a tough question. If you're a psycholinguist, are you a linguist or a psychologist? You know? mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. And what about your recent interest in pedagogy and SLA? 
Well, you know, I think really pedagogy came rather late. Um, I, I was mostly interested in the theory side. Um, the, um, I think, you know, maybe you really have to go back to Noam Chomsky at that point. <laughs> and the whole notion that we have a critical period for language acquisition. Um, you know, I tried to pull apart the Chomskyan ideas into what I consider to be the eight basic parts of the program. And the one that seems to be most accepted by most people, it's almost the strongest part, of, is the notion of a critical period. Mm -hmm. And yet, it really isn't that well supported by biology. So, so I found that, so, so, you know, thinking about this, and I, I have been interested in, you know, second language anyway, but really not pedagogy, it was more sort of processing. And so, you know, I worked on this model of first language acquisition, and I started to look at second language acquisition, and I saw that actually they weren't all that different. I mean, a lot of people were overstating how different they were. Um, and of course, they're difficult. It's more difficult for a second language learner, but there are reasons for that. So, really, it took a while to kind of put together the pieces. You know, I still think that the critical period hypothesis is a really interesting issue. Um, but then, I think from that notion that, that first and second language are similar in many ways, but different in some ways, really you go to pedagogy from that. Because then you say, well, where are the barriers to second language acquisition? What, what is it exactly that makes it difficult? And soon you start to realize that some of it is not, is, is that the teaching is not that good. You know, as a learner of many languages, I taught myself in certain ways, and I, I mean, I benefited some from classroom instruction, but not that much. <laughs> and so that makes me think that there must be better ways, and when I learn things, you know, I see there are resources on the web, but they're incomplete too, so I, I just felt, and I think other people have felt this too, that, that we could do better. And so that really, I think, you know, it, and also if we can do better and we can demonstrate that people can learn better, then the critical period notion, I think you have to change how you, how you assess that. I mean, we know that some people do acquire second languages as adults rather well. You know, you know there are polyglots. So how can they do so well? Um, you know, if we ended the critical period and what, maybe they have a different gene or something, it doesn't, I mean, it's possible, but unlikely. So, so I think really instruction and learning methods. Um, and so, it, you know, I still am interested though in the dynamic between the first and the second. You know, how is the first different from the second to me? Really, in a sense, that's the fundamental question that I, I really like to, like to focus on. Yeah. So, yeah. Pedagogy, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to the second question. Oh, okay, sure. Sure. <laughs> so you talk about a multi-dimensional immersion test view of SLA. Yeah. And we have a few little questions, smaller questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the main distinguishing factors from alternative views um, in the field? Mm. And what are the strengths and limitations? How does it conceptualize the role of time frames in our thinking about first and second language learning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, uh, Professor Han has uh, wrote a very beautiful paper um, summarizing all, all the different theories in the field and checking off are these, you know, do we have circular reasoning on the empirical basis and all this, but I think there were 25. Mm -hmm. You know, so how I could distinguish from every one of those 25 might I might not have it all in my mind right now, you know. But, I mean, the most obvious would be the Chomskyan view, you know, which uh, states that there is, um, you know, Chomsky said, well, probably there's a single gene for language, you know, which to me is just, you know, I've been reading this book by uh, Mary Jane uh, West Everhart uh, about uh, developmental plasticity and evolution. And, you know, anybody who thinks that a complex trait like language could be due to a single gene. I mean, I just don't understand how the... Now, it could be that a single gene had many, many effects on many other things. I, I guess Chomsky gets this from Stephen Gould, who, you know, has these ideas. Uh, he could talk about this as the... Uh, the, the what is it? What is it? He calls it a... Uh, uh, it's a part of a cathedral. I can't remember the name of it. But it's something that accidentally happens. And... Uh, this is very rare in biology, actually, but 
if, if that's true, it's really not that that particular gene has changed, it's that there already were many, many structures that were supporting language. So we, I think the, the idea is that there's a very gradual evolution of language in the human species over six million years, supported by many, many things. In the end, you know, something, uh, uh, something emerges in the most recent period, maybe the last uh, 100,000, 300,000 years, that puts many of these other things together. Uh, but a single gene is just hard, hard, to, hard to really imagine. Um, so, so that's, I think, a big contrast between an emergentist view and, a, and, a, and, and really the nativist. It, it's called nativist, but you know, nativist really is not the word, because I, I have nothing against biology. I mean, biology is certainly real. Uh, it's, it's that you think that just one little thing happened and suddenly we have language and without understanding that language is so many different. That's why multidimensional, you know? When I, when I say multidimensional, I really mean that language is based on so many different facilities. I mean, you can think maybe about the fact that we look each other in the face when we talk, okay? You know, gaze, right? And uh, obviously that we, you know, have control of our larynx. I mean, there's all these things that happen to the musculature of the larynx that, you know, didn't just happen overnight, you know? And things that happen to the, the, the innervation of the, even the, uh, uh, the muscles of the intercostal muscles are, are changed. The, you know, the, we know that 300,000 years ago there were some changes to the way we breathe, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's all these things between babies and their mothers that must have taken a, you know, a couple million years, and, and most important is the upright posture. So, you know, we, not that there are other animals, mammals, few mammals that have upright posture, but you know, really that, that was a unique thing and allowed us to look at each other um, and, and face each other. And of course, that may have met, led to sign language. So we're talking about millions of years of evolution, and each of these little things uh, leads to something that eventually supports language. So, you know, one thing would be um, even short-term memory uh, has, has had a growth in primates, uh, even before, you know, we go back before uh, humans. And then other things like um, conceptual organization uh, in the temporal lobe. And, you know, so there are many, uh, and then of course we see some people who can speak more fluently than others a lot of this has to do with uh, the motor cortex, how it's, how it's organized. Uh, we, we know that uh, some types of synaptic pruning are not as good in, in maybe, I mean, there's a, there's a mouse model of children who have specific language impairment. So if you go through all these pieces of neural development, social development, you see that language is made up of many, many different components. Uh, there's a lot of adaptation for articulation that's probably the biggest of all is articulation. But concepts are very different in uh, once we, and also once you have language, then the way that the primate conceptual world is organized is now changed for the human conceptual world. Uh, but the brain also adapted to this. So you, you really have to understand, this, this is a great book by uh, West Everhart. I really enjoy this. It's taking me days and days to get through this. But uh, you know, if, if you really understand biology, I think you understand how multidimensional Many of our traits are, they're, they're based on all sorts of underlying genetic uh, interactions, modules that recombine over time. Um, we all need to learn more genetics, <laughs> I think, you know. So, so that's a difference with, with Chomsky. But, you know, there are many people that are not nativists, and I would still, you know, I, I think there are other points of view that are mostly would say are part of the kinds of concepts I would have. So you could talk about, you know, crashing, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I certainly think comprehensible input is important. But one thing, and this goes back to that pedagogy question, is that um, I think adult learners can learn from, implicit, from explicit instruction. And so, you know, crashing is saying you can't learn anything from explicit instruction, everything is implicit. And yeah, I do believe that we do, in the end, sort of have to have implicit uh, exposure. But the adult can do a lot of focusing uh, that, you know, it, 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 e even to get implicit learning, you must have attention. You know, if you're ignoring something, you, you don't learn from it. The idea that you learn while you're sleeping, it, 
you consolidate your memories while you're sleeping, but if you turn on a tape recorder, you don't learn a language while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And children don't learn from television if they don't, you know, if they're little babies, you just turn on TV, they don't learn language. So they have to, there has to be a social, attentional focus on something uh, in order to really have it come in. Now, at that point, you may not, it may not come in explicitly, but if you do have explicit instruction and it's simple and clear, you can learn much faster than with, uh, you know, just slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, and I think one of the problems is that adults don't have enough time. I mean, children spend three and a half years, and actually really more. I mean, children really are not articulatorily competent until they're almost six. Really, it's, it's a long, long road. And people don't realize that. They say, oh, by age two, they've got their native language, you know. Yeah, but their articulation is terrible and still and their formation and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So so not terrible, but it's not adult standard, you know. It, it's very divergent. Um, so I think that um, with the adult you have less time and so you really have to rely more and more on explicit methods. So that would be, I think, very different from a Krashen's kind of approach, say. Um, I mean, you know, I could take other points of view um, you, you asked me about task-based learning, but maybe we'll talk about that later. But, you know, I, I guess the question might be, which other points of view? You know, Meryl Swain talks about comprehensible output. And I really agree with that, too. So I'm not saying comprehensible input isn't important. Of course it is. But, it's, but to rely only on that mm -hmm. is not adequate for an adult second language learner. Uh, and even, I, I would say, even for a child, there has to be, oh, children are often have to have some explicit attention to some linguistic forms. Otherwise, well, they'll learn it eventually, but they'd be much slower. But comprehensible output, I think, is really uh, interesting. Um, and I do tend to agree with that, although we have had, we did some studies um, supporting some earlier work, uh, I think by Kostevsky, um, that um, you should not speak too early when you're learning a second language, mm -hmm. that, that you can often learn your own errors. But certainly as you advance further and further, you definitely need to um, uh, have an opportunity to speak. Although you can acquire competence in reading uh, without doing that. So that, that, that's my example from Latin. You know, I mean, people don't really speak Latin that much, although they did, you know, in the church uh, in the Middle Ages and really up to the 17th, 18th century. And I still, I guess in, in, the, in the Vatican they still speak some Latin, but, but uh, and I know, I know people actually have fun speaking Latin, you know. But mostly it's for reading. And so you can acquire pretty much complete competence in, in reading without really too much output. So still, if you really want to be competent in output, you really have to have the opportunity to, to produce. So I would agree with Swain basically on that. Um, I don't know what other points of view are you interested in. Maybe I'll ask you, oh, what other yeah. theories do you like? So I'm, yeah, I'm, Please. I'm gonna, I, I, with your permission, you know, um, can I digress from the? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, as, as you were mentioning, um, you know, multi-dimensional view of SLA, I was just thinking about this recent development in the field about uh, on dynamic systems theory. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Theory. Um, so, how? What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that's a comprehensive theory which would actually explain? Even though, according to Dr. Hunt's um, recent article, it doesn't actually explain, uh, right, right. you know, acquisition, but what well, are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so if we talk about dynamic systems theory in terms of, uh, you know, going back to uh, Poya and the systems theory, uh, I heard Simon, uh, uh, I could, you know, other names of systems theorists, uh, uh, you know, even, uh, uh, not Turin, but uh, uh, von Neumann, um, then, you know, dynamic systems theory is is a almost a fundamental part of certainly physics, mm -hmm. so fluid dynamics, um, um, and also a, a lot of the studies of um, ca ca what they call catastrophe theories. When does an earthquake arise? Mm -hmm. How does a an avalanche form? Okay. Um, and also things in biology. There's a lot of dynamic systems in the uh, cell wall. Um, in the neurotransmission, the, the critical points that, that have to happen in order for a, a neuron to fire, um, and, and the sodium-calcium uh, uh, interchange, all these things. I mean, 
the, that part of dynamic systems theory, I think, I, I find hard to reject in any way. But then you ask, well, now are we applying it to language? So at that point, you know, there's there's uh, Van Geert, uh, and uh, who uh, I think has done some really interesting stuff. But he really isn't. Um, there isn't a linguist. He's really taking data from other people. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 really like Case de Bot and uh, uh, Mario Linker score, or you know, and of course there's there's uh, uh, Diane Larson Freeman, who have all articulated this point of view, and it is totally compatible with the view of the physicists. You know, so a lot of these people have gone to Santa Fe Institute and they talk with physicists like what's his name, the, you know, I can't remember his name right now, but, but and so they're on the same uh, mathematical, uh, you know, physical uh, page, right. but it has not been articulated in any reasonable way for language, it seems to me. Um, and, and I don't, th I think that if you look at Van Geert or Marty Lynn, or even uh, uh, Diane Larson, they are not looking sufficiently at the modules and the levels that are involved in language. They're just, the detail is really missing. So I am totally good with dynamic systems theory. Mm -hmm. I would say that my model is a version of dynamic systems right. theory. But it's got, there you have to add a lot more. Right. <laughs> there's, there's just so much missing in these accounts. So that's, I mean, it's, it's hardly a criticism. Now, there, there's also dynamic systems theory that you get from Esther Thalen and Linda Smith. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was looking more at um, early infant um, um, uh, either walking or hand motion. Right. And that was very, that also comes on in with uh, stuff you see from uh, Scott Kelso. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you get right to the level of motor movement, mm -hmm. then you have a very complete account. You don't have to worry about lexicon, morphology, conversational, uh, whatever. Uh, but then that's just articulation. Okay. So, but that is really interesting. So we could have a lot of, of interesting dynamic systems things really about uh, the mouth, about the mouth as a, as, as a physical organ. Oh, okay. But that's not what Larson Freeman and Ferspora are doing, yeah, you know? Yeah. So that's another dynamic system. But that is 100%. I mean, I have no problem with, with uh, Kelso. And I mean, even so, though he, his model really doesn't get up to telling us how phonology works. Mm -hmm. it, it it shows some good good effects that are really interesting. Uh, and and actually, he does more with the hand than he does with the mouth. Um, but I think you, I think that's the right path to go down. It, it, we really have to have to understand. Uh, in, in the end, systems theory is is absolutely necessary. And that has to be dynamic, yeah. So those just words, though, you know, at this point. Yeah. Just, just to clarify, when, when you said, like, my model along with um, DST, were you referring to the unified Yeah, 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 yeah. And, I mean, and, and I think it's important that the unified competition model have, is making, is building on lots of other models that are already out there. For example, there's a model of how the striate cortex and proceduralization work, and I'm just assuming that. I, and yet, I'm not even going to. That somebody else is doing that model. It's all been worked out. You know, we're not finished, but but we know a lot about that. And the hippocampal consolidation model. People know about that stuff. You know, and they, there are uh, mathematical models. So so, you know, as long as like you're compatible with these things, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So you wanted to know about DST. So you you wanted okay yeah so yeah like uh, yeah just to dig a little deeper in um, you know we were talking about the unified competition model so in terms of um, second language and first language acquisition uh, the model explains you know the difference in terms of the interplay of risk factors with protective factors um, and you also encourage L2 learners to make overt use of the protective factors. Um, yeah. In, in your paper. So w to what extent can these protective factors lead to learning success, to sec second language learning success in particular? I mean, I mean those are re research questions at this point, right. you know, really. Mm -hmm. um, I and mean, that's the problem in, I, I, I hate to say it, that's the problem in SLA research, you know. I mean, there's, uh, you know, either, I mean, I'll talk about this this afternoon, but, you know, either you do experiments which almost have nothing to do with what you know, people are actually doing as they're learning language, or, or well, you could do classroom experiments and they're un, and they're uncontrolled, 
or you do controlled experiments and they're irrelevant. Uh, so, you know, you really have a problem of tapping into this ongoing process. So, um, you know, I guess to me, you need to be able to get the data to really support the, to support the operation of the support factors. Mm -hmm. You need to run an experiment that essentially says, okay, um, we've got a group of students that are really learning on the basis of, say, um, some kind of graduated interval recall, or, uh, I mean, I can give you a bunch of different, you know, manipulations that will support these support processes. And, you know, if the students use that, then we have a pre-test and a post-test and we find out if it works. Okay. And the, the only way you can do this is if you really have commitment from the students, from the learners, and their teachers. So this is, you know, there's a lot of issues here that have to be worked out for, but I, you know, for SLA research to really make progress in terms of, well, let me back up and say that I think there's a really fundamental problem that everybody thinks this is the right way to sort of learn a second language and no one can prove it. You know, I mean, everybody has their own idea. And we, that's fair enough. We all have our own, we've all learned second languages. We have our own ideas. I, you know, my idea actually is that there are many ways to learn second languages and that they really vary from person to person. And maybe some of you share that idea. But even that is not articulate enough because we don't know which method for which person when and how has it been provided, and a lot of the methods that are provided are really incomplete. I mean, so, you know, it, it, I think we have to really work out good methods for testing the effects of these different uh, instructional methods. Um, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on, you know, explicit feedback, correction, and those are good. I think some of those studies we can build on, but um, there's so much more to be done, you know. I mean, you might, let me just say, you might ask which of those support factors is the most important. And, you know, and I do in the end think that participation is. I mean, I think, you know, me actually using the language, you know, joining, and joining, there's no question that joining and using the language. But, but even within that, that's not enough for some people. They still need other things, too. Or else they, you know, they get a little bit of fossilization. I mean, I don't want to overstate that, but you'll get something. You know. Yeah, I think you already mentioned this in passing. We wanted to ask you what you thought the role of individual factor, difference factors such as aptitude, motivation, yeah, yeah. participation played in this model. Yeah, and yeah. I guess it is still up to empirical methods to show. Uh, right, right. No, we. I mean, obviously none of this is really well supported by the kinds of studies that I would like. But, you know, I think that the evidence on motivation is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, the av evidence on aptitude might not be as good, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but even motivation, of course, the problem is measurement, you know. But, uh, you know, again, Professor Han said, and I think agree with her, that the initial period of language acquisition is really based primarily on aptitude and most of motivation. Mm -hmm. And I would say motiv mostly motivation. Uh, you know, at least, you know, I mean, a great example of this, like, you know, Duolingo is a, uh, is a, yeah, it, it, and this is by uh, uh, Louis Fonan in, in Pittsburgh, and, you know, I, uh, as a side note, I'll, I'll get back to this individual differences, but, you know, people are beginning Duolingo, and then they drop out. You know, it's huge, and so, so you can't really say, well, what's the effect of Duolingo? You don't know. It's only for those few people that have continued, and, and what they were, that, that's then a select group. So you need a sense that, um, well, I mean, if people drop out, drop out. You know, that's understandable. But, but the level of dropout was, is just enormous. Um, so motivation really has to get you up to that initial, uh, uh, really to the middle, to the middle point of learning, I think, where you start to feel comfortable. Um, now, aptitude, though, you know, and, and whether we want to measure motivation, and the other thing, of course, you really should pull apart motivation into lots of different types of motivation. I don't know how much, you know, I guess the, the person who's, you know, referred to most is Dernier on this, right? And other people, too, but, you know, he's a whole book on motivation. But you read it, and in the end, yeah, motivation is important, and that's all I get. I, I really can't say anything more than that at this point. You know, so it's totally important, but I don't know. You know, is it financial, marital, 
Is it because of your, you know, uh, ethnic background? Um, is it, you know, you're a linguist and you just love learning languages or right. something, you know, you, you know uh, I, 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 I think those different motivations might really have a big impact and no one's really been able to pull that apart yet. So, aptitude. <laughs> um, that is something that, so you, you mentioned, you know, I'm interested in pedagogy, it's true, but I think in order to do, to, to really um, get good pedagogy in place, one really should have um, widely accepted aptitude measures. And, uh, you know, obviously the Defense Language Institute has done this, you know, they have their tests, I mean, we have, you know, e, uh, uh, ETS has their tests, I mean, all these tests, but they don't measure underlying cognitive abilities. You know, they're just, you know, they're, they're kind of a big soup, actually. Um, not to totally. I mean, there are, they did factor analyses on something. So, I mean, I mean maybe overstated how so much of a soup they are. But, but from, maybe, from my point of view, again, this, when I say multidimensional, I think thinking lots of little pieces combined, you know, lots of little ones. And so you want to see each one of those little ones, what's the aptitude in each one. Auditory, to me, is a big one. I, it's been so much skipped, um, you know, I mean, one thing is, okay, can you hear a distinctive feature contrast, but I'm more interested in whether people have uh, auditory short-term memory that preserves chunks for rehearsal, and that whether they hear, particularly with tones, you know, it's, it's, it's really got to hear the whole contour of the word, you keep the whole word in mind, and, you know, so there are many, and, and, and actually for overall sentence tones, occasionally, uh, um, have to be picked up. It's not just, you know, word-level tones. So, um, and it's not just in tone languages that we have these, you know, tones going on, mm -hmm. in, in intonation contours. So how well do you, do you really hear those and store them long enough, and maybe in a chunk, mm -hmm. in order to really, you know, acquire it? And then there's these very different types of um, how, how well you move your mouth, mm -hmm. how precise uh, control do you have over your tongue, you know? Um, and then there's the memory, you know, and, or, or lexical learning. So each of these little uh, uh, skills, um, there's also, you know, people say, well, maybe attentional focusing is important. Uh, can we measure the degree to which people can do attentional switching? Um, you know, I'm a little less sure that that's important, but all of these things really should be measured. So we're, what we're doing, actually, is making online measures for these things. Um, I should say we... We've sketched out what we want to do. We haven't, you know, I need more programmer time to get it all on the web. But, but I think that's the way um, I'd like to see is, um, I think we could really look at aptitude, you know, in more detail. Motivation, I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> so is that your question really about aptitude and motivation? Yeah. Or it I seems like that may be more of the question than that. No, that was just a short question because those are the two major individual difference factors. I think yeah, I guess about. that's true. Yeah, so. yeah, aptitude. I mean, some aptitude always is also not going to be measured until maybe you've seen how a person um, consolidates. Mm -hmm. So, so an aptitude measure that looks at a stimulus and gives a response, you know, in ten seconds, maybe one minute at the most, that may not give us the whole picture. Because some, some learning mechanisms, you know, there's this work from uh, University College London, Gaskell, that shows that people consolidate over sleep. And, and there's a lot more of that, not just the sleep, naps and things. And so the, the consolidation process, and, and maybe not just one day, maybe weeks. So the consolidation process, you're not going to get that in a little test without, you know, coming back and back and back. So, this is, it, it's a little tricky to really measure how individual differences work there. I don't know, are there other individual differences that you had thought about perhaps, or any of you that maybe uh, you feel as, uh, uh, I mean motivation for sure, okay, we've got that, but, well, of oh, course, the obvious one is language background. So, you know, and we have these language questionnaires, um, and that's, that's good, but, it's very hard to put that into uh, a numerical predictor that really works very well. Uh, I guess it is generally true that people who are learning, who have already learned one other language, or either either simultaneously or, or sequentially, th you know, that's already an advantage, clearly, I guess. I guess the data is pretty clear on that. But, um, but if you try to slice it any further, it's hard. You know? 
And the other one, well, the other one would be language distance. Uh, and that one, I think, is pretty clear. So it's obviously easier to learn a closer, generally easier to learn a closer language. Uh, although <laughs> sometimes you'd be surprised. Sometimes you're surprised. Uh, it, easier for some, so obviously Chinese script is very hard for, for, for Latin-based, uh, Roman-based, sorry. But, um, but other aspects of Chinese are not actually that hard in a way. So, and actually Danish pronunciation is really hard. Really hard. You know, even hearing Danish, you know, the sounds of Danish, are, are the vowels of Danish are, are incredibly difficult, even for Danish kids. Yeah, yeah. They, they are, they are uh, one year behind, almost more than a year behind other uh, kids in Europe in reading because of the difficulties of their own language. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so that, you know, the, the psycholinguistic uh, individual differences, but then there's the, you know, there's the life history and, uh, and the language distance. Boy, a lot of differences, yeah. So I think there are a lot of people who say like I'm just not a language person. Yeah. But, you know, like I I st I started studying when I'm too old, so I don't think I could ever learn a second language. Yeah. Um, but to those people, would you say you know that's not necessarily the case because if you take into account all these factors, different factors, it is potentially possible to overcome those risk factors. Well, I, you know, I think that's a great question. I really, I really like that question because, you know, I, I mean, we've all seen that, but if, as a, I haven't been a language teacher. I've been, you know, designed materials, i learned languages, but I haven't. You know, that's not totally true. I did some, a little language teaching for a short time, but not, you know, year after year. And so if you're a language teacher, you know, you're going to see this kind of thing, or, well, maybe people won't take a class. But don't, aren't they almost required to in many places to take a class? And then that's even worse, right? So they're required to, and they feel they can't, and you know, uh, that's terrible. And then they're assessed too. And then they're assessed, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. And then you're assessed because you, you failed to teach right. them, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, you know, I probably, uh, you know, in res you know, this is like, trying to be Bill Clinton and I feel your pain, you know? <laughs> uh, but I would say that I, definitely there is hope. I say definitely. And if there may be, you know, I think maybe it's a question of setting what level of achievement is appropriate for a person who has not yet had language learning experience, what is the easiest way. And you know, we, we have these things like Rosetta Stone, which I look at and I think, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. But it may be that Rosetta Stone isn't bad for people who are really, really not able to, um, you know, think of language in another way or haven't had other experiences and they, they really need to move through very, very slowly uh, to, to feel confident, maybe, maybe just to feel confident that they can do it. So um, I, I guess I really like your overall question about individual differences, but it, it then how are you going to do this as a teacher? You can't, because if you have these all these people with individual differences, all that shows that you really need some computational support. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there is a real role for the teacher in, in, in terms of classroom support, and showing the model and everything, but in terms of individualization of instruction, that I don't see how teachers can do that. Mm -hmm. So they need to have these alternative methods that are, you know, really selectable by the, by the, the learner. And that, that, that's the goal, I think, is that the learner should be able to, okay, this is working for me, this is not working for me. Even so, there'll still be some people who get a drop out. Right. You know, it's just, you know, but I think you want to make it more accessible. Yeah. So, we'll move on to the next one. So, you've already started to talk about this, but can you elaborate on the role of an explicit and explicit learning in your framework? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, I was teaching too. So, you know, I think maybe 15, 20 years ago, I would have been very much on the side of implicit mm -hmm. uh, because, um, well, I hadn't thought about it very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there was a, number one, that was the biggest reason, you know, it, and it wasn't as, you know, I mean, there was already, I guess Ellis had a book on this fairly far back, right? Um, 
and yet that book wasn't really definitive at that time. I think it became much clearer when you know Ellis did a lot more, and other people too, both Ellis's actually. You know, mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the 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 mood in the '90s, really late '80s, was um, you know PDP and uh, and the idea that everything you know you know data comes in and there really was no other process, it was just this interaction of cues. And, um, you know, at that point my model was still focusing on child language learning. Uh, we did have models for, you know, second language learning, but they were not dynamic models. And they really didn't deal with, you know, really the course of learning, they just dealt with a frozen state of a second language learner at point X. And, and that worked, you know, we had cue validity and everything would, would predict it, but we didn't understand the transitions. And um, really, we didn't uh, also understand fluency. Uh, fluency was definitely not part of the whole story at all. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, fatal for a second language if you don't talk about fluency, you know. So, um, so, so, so PDP, you know, you, you learn the past tense of the English verb, or you learn maybe even some lexical structures, and, and that would be definitely implicit. Although, there was actually a, a funny trick inside PDP, or connectionism in general, uh, back propagation actually did use error correction. You know, sort of sneaked in there, which is like, every time I say a word, is somebody giving me error correction? I don't think so, you know? You know, so and then there were, there was this sort of strange idea that, well, Maybe it's not that somebody's giving you error correction. You're sort of correcting yourself by imagining how you might say it. So, you know, there are ways that you have an internal image of went, and you say goad, and oh, it really should have been went. Uh, but it was never articulated, you know. And, and actually, it, that's a crucial failure of PDP, um, that it relied on backpropagation, which assumed error-driven error learning, and that's just fundamentally wrong. Uh, there are other problems with, with PDP and backpropagation. We, we got out of that eventually when we went into the system called uh, DevLex, which uses self-organizing feature ma uh, maps and uh, doesn't base on, on error correction. Uh, so, so, you know, that showed that you could still have implicit learning. This is with uh, Ping Li and uh, Igor Farkas and some other people. Um, and those models work pretty well. But they really just work for the very, very simple, learn some lexicon, learn, they don't, I and mean, no one really has handled PDP for syntax properly. So at that point, you're, you're really back to, um, you, well, the whole world of symbolic versus PDP, you know, Pinker versus McClellan, uh, you know, got involved in that. And um, in the end, I, you know, I don't think either point of view really was adequate. Uh, the the, the uh, symbolic people really never had a model, never, never a proper learning model. Uh, the PDP people, uh, you know, just didn't consider the role of lexical items, and you know, there's, there's things that, that they didn't have levels properly organized, uh, you know, different, different linguistic levels. So, at that point, you know, I had to have a falling out with implicit, I guess. Um, and, and really, I think I wouldn't have been moved so much to explicit, except that every time I ran an experiment, explicit was better. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it really comes down to that. Uh -huh. I, I think the other thing, I did write a paper, uh, it was a commentary on one of these implicit, explicit issues, and maybe it was in uh, Applied Linguistics, I can't remember which journal it was in. Um, and you know there were several papers um, in there, and as I, I was a commentator, and I went through this paper and I said, explicit always works when the cues are simple. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the, what's the fairly famous lady at Oregon who retired a number of years ago. Uh, uh, anyway, but she 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 showed that it was very complicated to learn explicit give an explicit structure about subjacency. Well, yeah, subjacency is really difficult even to understand explicitly. I mean, you know, um, 
so there are, and, and, and why and God is another one. You can make explanations of difference between why and God that are really difficult, you know, all different versions of, you know, God's unmarked and why is this things, and there's a combinatorial use of, I guess there's a double use of, of God, of why, you know, why, da, 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 why, and so on, and, and you can just totally confuse the learner at that point. Um, so, but if there's a simple cue that predicts, you know, uh, yon is always feminine, uh, you know, in uh, say Spanish, or, or you know, east actually is always masculine in French, you know, and, and, and you know, it doesn't seem like it would be, but it is. Um, so, you know, a simple cue that predicts gender, a simple cue that predicts word order, um, or phonology even, um, learners just get it like that. So, and now, then the question becomes, well, do they consolidate it, you know? So maybe it's true, and, and this, this is what I really, really now believe, okay, is that you, and, and this is a little bit like Professor Hahn's uh, uh, ideas about uh, these changes over time and energy. Um, if you acquire something explicitly and then continually use it for a while, it essentially consolidates itself implicitly. So, so through usage, uh, and that would go back to swing in a way, you know, comprehensive output, but it can also be used as just reading, honestly. Uh, so, so I think that's really a function of how the hippocampus works with the cortex. Uh, that that you, you, you've, you've acquired something, but it's still a little fragile. And that it needs to be really integrated into a lot of different frameworks and, and possibilities. Um, part of the implicit explicit also gets into, well, there, there, there are, so that's my basic answer, okay? But, but let me add some more, okay, okay. So some of, some of the further problems are having to do with chunking and with episodic memory. So, so chunks, you know, chunks are chunks, but eventually, are, are, is that implicit or explicit? You know, if you, you know, how are you today? You know, that's a chunk, or why do you, uh, why do you say that, or, you know. Um, is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it sits on the implicit explicit uh, di dichotomy, it's really something else that we pick up chunks, you know. So chunks are episodic, and, and there's a lot of learning, maybe of a new word even, that doesn't require many, many trials because it's so clearly linked to a particular place and time that you have a clear episode of. But then maybe it will generalize. So it's, if, if, it, in other words, one of the big problems we have with frequency, and this, you know, frequency is obviously a part of the implicit learning thing, you know, from Nick Ellis, the more frequent it is, the more powerful it gets, and I'm, I'm good with that from a PDP connectionist point of view, that's fairly true. But uh, there's also recent research from uh, Stefan Gris, for example, looking at uh, corpora more um, in terms of, um, well, he, he, he he uses lexical frequency as uh, in these um, mul in these um, uh, logistic models, uh, mul what do you call them, multiple regression linguistic models, trying to see what are the predictors of reaction time on words. And it turns out frequency is really not that important. Uh, you know, it, it's it, it, it's correlated with so many other things that it comes out and you think it's important, but actually it's more things like imagistic imagery age of acquisition, all sorts of other things, and in the end, frequency is actually not as big a determinant of, of lexical accessibility as some of these other things, which has, you know, gotten me more and more to think that one of the things that happens is that you pick up words to fill a practical niche. This goes to task-based learning maybe a little bit. Okay, that, that there's a place where this word is appropriate and necessary, and if that word is like the only word for that thing, then it has no competitors and it's much easier to learn. But if there are lots of little words for different types of plates and you can't remember, or, or Chinese cups, and I think there's all these Chinese cups that, you know, uh, or vessels and things, uh, actually Spanish plates and c cooking instruments, and lots of Spanish cooking instruments. And then you don't know which one's which and you forget uh, and, and you confuse things. So, uh, so there's really good experimental evidence that in t tight lexical fields, you need a lot of rehearsal, but you know, place where there's only one way of saying something and, you know, it's actually the right word, uh, you could have one trial learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that, you know, it's not just frequency, not just the implicit, it's also this sort of episodic thing. Uh, 
complex, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so interesting. It, it is. It really is interesting. I think we're learning a lot about that. Right. You know, I think we are. So um, with, with this question, we're kind of changing the focus of the okay, question sure. a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the developments in, in e-call, which sounds yeah. very, uh, very exciting. Um, so can you tell us more about it and what you see as the potential applications of e-call for research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm extremely enthusiastic about the idea, and what's missing mostly is money. So we really need about 10 or 20 million dollars to do this. Even though the, the focus of the field is on technology and the use, even then it's difficult to... Yeah, the, you, the United States government only wants to fund uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and I think though that we'll have, we, have, we will in general have better luck in Europe eventually, and definitely I'm, I'm very optimistic about the Far East. So I'm actually going to go to Taiwan, work with some people there in the, in the spring, and I, they're doing something, and I, I think we can bring together some international resources. The U.S. is really a loser in this one area, really bad. I mean, you know, now we have good programs like yours, and people do teaching, but, but in terms of financing of resources, um, I, let me, I think it's important to lay these, you know, this out. We'll right. get to the real in, sure. the interesting part in a bit, but uh, the other thing is people say, well, we could do this by uh, uh, private industry. You know, this is the American approach, right? <laughs> private industry. Privatized. Okay, privatized. Well, the pro and, and there are a lot of people who want to make money off second language instruction, right? Uh, you know, what is it? I mean, ETS, uh, Rosetta Stone, uh, Duolingo. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, it's just, it, there must be 30 of these and, and probably at least a, a dozen that are not so bad. The problem is none of them want to let their results out to researchers mm -hmm. because they're afraid they'll be shown to be ineffective. Okay. Or, they, number one, or they'll give competitive advantage if you might leak some of their trade secrets to their competitors. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a non-starter. Mm -hmm. and, and you send a grant proposal to the federal government and say, well, it's already being done by these companies. You know, no, it's not being done because we have no idea what they're, what they're actually doing. You know, we don't know the individual differences, we don't know the results, no one's assigned to the individual, you know, there's no assignment to, uh, uh, independent assignment, you know, random assignment. So, so we really have to have researchers do this. And at this point, with not much money. Right. <laughs> okay. But I, it, it will, I, it's got to be the right way to go. I mean, we, we were fortunate we got money from uh, the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center which actually came through NSF because they didn't realize we were doing language, you know. They, otherwise, I'm sure they wouldn't they have given it to it. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and my colleagues sort of, you know, say, well, we're going to do math, chemistry, and language. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Why are you doing language? I don't get <laughs> So they gave us quite a lot of money for 10, maybe eight, eight, nine, not quite 10 years. And so we got fairly far with this. Um, I would have liked to have gone further. Uh, we, we, know, we know what we have to do to go further. So, it, you know, it's just... You know, we need it. You guys have all these big donors here at Columbia. Why don't we get one of these donors, like Edinburgh or, right, you know, Swimmer. I, honestly, Gates or somebody, you know, that would do it. I think that, that would really do it. So anyway, so the, without, without that, we could still make some progress. So, what, so let me out, lay out what, what he calls, basically. So, um, and I'll talk about this this afternoon, so it's, it's all in the slides. Um, so the basic idea is that students, learners, will want to have different types of experiences, and they should be able to select that. So that's one, so we need to provide these many different types. Uh, at the same time, we want to have this link to the classroom. So I, I think from a motivation point of view, you're going to be more motivated if you have a teacher who's helping you along. I mean, you can do it by yourself, but I don't think, you know, you'll be a lot more drawn back. Uh, now, of course, if you're in a study abroad program, I think, but even then you'd have a teacher, you know. So I'm assuming a teacher, but I'm also assuming a wide variety of experiences that the student can select about. But of those, some are going to be assigned by the teacher. Some of the basic things. So my, my example of this is pinyin. Um, uh, pinyin uh, dictation, essentially. So you hear a Chinese word, and you write out the pinyin. That means you must know the initials, the finals, and the tones. Um, and those are not that easy, <laughs> you know. And you'd be surprised. I mean, second-year students are still. You know, people teach pinyin in the first 
eight weeks of class in the fall, you know, Chinese one. And oh, now you know it. <laughs> no, <laughs> not even close, not even close, not even close. Uh, particularly some of the sounds. And, and, and there's just a lot, it, eventually, of course, you do learn. I'm not saying that you don't, but, but the faster you learn, the better it will be for your overall progress in Chinese. Um, so, so that is a case where the teacher, we have some uh, class, we, we have maybe 1,200 people use it each fall, maybe, maybe more, I don't know, sometimes it's more, but in I think about 30 different institutions, and the, the idea there, is, you know, they're using it, but what I would really like is to say to the teachers, okay, within your group I want to assign half of them to this condition and half to that condition, and, and really right now, we've done that with several. Uh, several places that we have good contact with, but you know, I think that that should be the approach that you have this have this method. So at that point, you can run a real experiment. Um, but there's a further requirement, which is that you really want to do it within subjects design. So do you guys understand that there's a difference between the within and the between? Okay, in terms of power, it's huge. That goes to your individual differences question. Because, I mean, you know, you've got learners at all these different levels, and you throw them all in one statistical thing, so much variance that you find nothing of your effect. But if each learner is their own control, all that variance is, is, is gone, and all you've got is the variance due to the treatment. Um, and, you know, we got effects from a group of uh, 15 learners on a what I considered a fairly weak, uh, you know, like a, a three-hour instructional program in Chinese, uh, uh, actually character drawing, you know, uh, learning, you know, character, character instruction. I mean, because it was a within subject design, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, so within subject is really the right way to do it. So the, from a methodology point of view, um, I'm, you know, you, I guess there's sort of two things. One is you want all these resources out there because learners need them. But in order to get the research, you want to be able to say, okay, let's look at this one particular aspect and make sure the students are all doing this and we'll, we'll do this within subject design, okay? So um, I think it all has to come together. Now there are other parts, so I mean, I, I, I don't have my illustration in my whole talk here now, because it's all this have to do, you know, but, okay, you know, but, but the idea is that inside this, well, you saw the diagram, but it, I, you know, I might have, there's a modified version of it, because we've built more parts now, but um, there has to be, and well, we had a meeting, sorry, sorry if I don't finish that sentence, we had a meeting in Lancaster in this last summer, um, actually about a year ago. Um, quite a few of the people in SLA were there. I mean, are the, some of, I wouldn't say all the big names, but I said half the big names, okay. And um, they all were talking about bringing together corpus linguistics with, uh, well, with experimental linguistics, mm -hmm. experimental methods. Uh, so it was Patrick Rebuchat's kind of thing, but it was, you know, Nick Allison, Pauline, Allison Mackey, all these other people. And, you know, what I, what I said was, look, you can do this by the online uh, experiment, putting your experiments online, and, you know, collecting the corpora, you know, linking all these within this sort of e-call framework. And everybody actually agreed. I mean, I really did not get any pushback, but that doesn't mean that they're going to go out and do it. Yeah. So, but I, I was actually very interested that uh, the lady from Louvain, um, you know, the corpus lady, uh, Louvain, what's, she has all these, uh, you know, second English as a second language corpora. I'm sure you know if I said the name. But anyway, she said, yeah, we should give you all these data. So, so the idea that a lot of these corpora that have been locked up will actually eventually be opened up. And, you know, yeah, people will... So I, th I think we can eventually get some collaboration, but but people, you know, have their own careers and their own deadlines. So, so, so right now, I think the thing is, um, so we want to have the basic. So the, the components are basic skills, and that's the thing like the opinion tutor with the important vocabulary. And then the other is uh, corpora. So corpora can be collected from learners themselves, or we can have, you know, there, there's a huge corpus now from Oxford. Uh, or Cambridge, sorry, Cambridge, and it's being opened up, so that'll be great. Um, you know, we, uh, and then the experiments, you know, that are, uh, so we can have both experiments um, within the lessons, but you can have even separate experiments, and then the individual difference measures that we're talking about. And then the other component has to be what we call language learning in the wild. 
which is, you know, really, you know, you've got your iPad, we give you instructions, I'll, you know, I'll give you illustrations of this later. And, and, and I think that allows the student to use the, uh, the, the, the classroom as a way of interacting with, the, you know, the, world, the city, the world. So all of these things, I mean, I would love this. If I were trying to learn, you know, let's say I'm trying to learn Danish. I had a terrible time learning Danish because there were no materials. No one wanted to talk Danish. Why should we? Um, you know, just, it was totally, you know, I can, I, I can read Danish fine, but I'm never, never, you know, it was just, right. uh, if these materials had been available for me, it would have made a huge difference. You know, and I actually tried to find some of these that were all locked up and proprietary. It was just ridiculous. So, uh, so I think putting these all together is, and, and so the other thing is that the compute, the, the programming basis for these things is language general. In other words, if you do German and Chinese, you can do Portuguese and Arabic. I mean, mostly. I mean, there's some minor differences there. But you know, you do one language, you can more or less do many if you do it right. So um, really what we need, to be quite honest, is money. <laughs> yeah, I think, we, I think we, know, we know what we can do. In other words, all the technology is there. It, it, it all works. That's, uh, you know. Yeah, wonderful, but where's the money yet? Well, we, 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 I don't want to be too critical. We do have some, do we have some money. Right. But not the amount to make it happen in the next five years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be more like 15 if we don't get money. Yeah. And you started with English as a second language? No, no. No, actually we started Chinese as a second oh, language. Right. Yeah. English, um, so, so it really depended on, on the skill area. One of the things is we really tried to target things that are difficult in each language. So in English, we talked about uh, articles and uh, prepositions, uh, you know, verb preposition com you know, combinations. Um, um, probably, you know, aspect is a problem pretty much in every language, I suppose. Yeah. We haven't really ta tackled aspect yet. But articles in English, no question. Um, also, in a different way, articles in German because of the case margin, mm -hmm. not because of the conceptual basis, but um, we have that. Uh, Spanish, the verb. Um, you know, each so each language it's a different area, but we you know we, we it's we probably would want the verb in German too. It's just not as much of a challenge as Spanish. Um, in uh, French, it's uh, orthography. Right. Uh, obviously, pronunciation too, but it's the main, main the biggest thing is orthography is, is you know spelling. It's actually spelling. And and people say, well, that's not a, a, a French one problem, and I agree with that. But but you start learning to spell wrong, and you know, to and that's not great, you know. Um, so, so we've done French, German, uh, Spanish, uh, so parts of French, German, Spanish, Chinese, actually a little bit of Cantonese. We have so the, the pinyin tutor is also the Yupin tutor, um, which is I think really fun. <laughs> oh, Cantonese is, is you know, it, once you've learned Mandarin, Cantonese is not easy. It's it's just you've got to start all over again. It's just yeah, yeah you just start all, start all, forget your forget your Mandarin. No help at all. Do you know? Did you guys ever learn Cantonese? No? Okay, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, um, yeah, what else would I say about e-call? Um, so the other thing is, you know, you do get data out of this. A huge amount of data is that it's, it's uh, we, we have so much data that we, it, honestly, we, I've been spending my time trying to build more methods, skip, flesh the whole thing out. There's so much data we've got and we haven't even analyzed a lot of it. And it's all, it's all open if people want to look at some of this stuff, you know. One last question sure. regarding on this uh, topic. So, is is there a particular reason uh, for choosing the uh, uh, quote unquote heart features in these yeah, languages? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, why not just to add a lot of that? I mean, right. vocabulary. I think everybody should just have a vocabulary tutor, and that would be every language. Right. Question. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think this, I think there's good motives for the Spanish verbs. I really do. I think um, if you don't, that, this goes back to the implicit explicit thing. That if you don't get a little bit of explicit training, so that we really focus there on the uh, um, on this, uh, we call the, the um, we call them not quasi regulars there. The minor rules is what linguists call them. The Spanish teachers call them something else, but it's you know, uh, colgo, cuelga, colgar, you know, colgar, colgar. So the, the stem changing and a couple other spelling spelling rules really stem changing and spelling rules rather than the fully regulars. Um, Probably should do both. I feel we have gotten some criticism by focusing on 
easily teachable cues. You cover a lot of the vocabulary very quickly, but you tend to leave out the real irregulars, which of course are very important. But we, we did one, experiment, one or two experiments on that, I guess two, yeah, that uh, if you do throw in the irregular, you know, the real irregulars like fuiste, you know, it's, it's like the verbs to be is always irregular, right? Um, it, it, it's not a problem, okay? It's just that it makes the teaching longer. You have, to, you have to spend more time teaching first the regular pattern, then the, you know, quasi-regular patterns or the stem changing, and then the true irregulars. And that's true also in German gender. So one of the big challenges in German is you, you don't know the gender of the noun, you're, you're, you're dead. And there's no, not these simple uh, phonological cues that there are in French. Well, even French is better than, 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 than German, you know. Um, so it's really complex. And we, we actually did a study with uh, uh, German majors, um, fourth-year German majors you know, in, in the US. And they were very far from ceiling. So there were a few that got 90%, but there were a lot of them that were getting 60% uh, accuracy, 55 even, where chance is 40. Okay, so yeah. majors. Okay, so so the, it, I think there are good reasons if, because if you don't know the gender of a German, now again it's implicit, explicit. If a child doesn't learn learn them in this explicit way, but they do get a sense that if it's Shen, line, those those endings are always neuter. Mm -hmm. There's certain cues that they do pick up after a while. Mm -hmm. So um, and some of them are a little harder, but but. You know, kids don't make the gender errors. All, but there's some re other reasons. I, I could get into that why kids aren't making the gender errors. But, mm -hmm. but for the adults, who really, the, they, they've already learned improperly. They, you'll, you'll hear this again in my talk, but it's mm -hmm. that they've done over analysis, and um, because of the over analysis, they missed the real crucial cues to gender, and now they've got to fix that. <laughs> So, so these are really basically helping people with things they messed up, I think. I don't know if I want to say that about the article. <laughs> you know, my, uh, my daughter-in-law is still having troubles. Not so much with the article, actually. She, funny, she, her trouble, well, certainly with uh, verb tense, yeah. But, you know, it, I guess, you know, this goes to your individual differences. It's interesting why some people have trouble with certain parts of the grammar and not others. Isn't that really weird? You know, it's not, it's not uniform, and, and that suggests that there's so many little pieces underneath there that are moving in different ways. Multidimensional. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, our last question, I think you uh, touched upon and we were going to ask you about mm -hmm. the shared infrastructure for studying as a link to the title of your talk. So, I'm sure that when uh, students and researchers hear about it, they'd be very excited. Is there a way to like, partake? I'm sorry, which talk are you talking about? The, 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 the one with the you? first talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Shared yeah. infrastructure. Yeah, shared infrastructure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so is there a way for other researchers to partake in this? Right, 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 right. Well, first of all, definitely uh, teach, if, if teachers will use the materials in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And actually, if they worked with us as um, by, by saying, okay, we want to run this experiment, then there can be co authors on the papers, you know? I mean, I, I don't understand why, you know, probably, I don't understand why people don't get that. You know, maybe we haven't publicized it. We're not spending my time publicizing everything. You know? mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, opinion tutor, we write, put it on Chinese language teacher, you know, C CLTA uh, list, and, and people, oh, yeah, that's great, and they use it, you know. But we haven't really publicized the fact that, that yeah, you could do research with this, you know. Uh, and we'd love that. We'd love to do that. So that would be the most easy and obvious. I mean, the other only the only other thing is, you, yes, you could do if you could program, but then you really got to be a programmer at that point. But the kind of programming we're doing would be accessible to um, you know if you have a programmer working for you or the department has a programmer. Yes, this is not like hypermedia. You really have to do serious. You know, it's real. Uh, actually, it's, it's JavaScript programming. And uh, the nice thing about it is that once you program, it runs on all devices. So it runs you know, in the browser, um, on your computer, and it runs on the iPad and the iPhone. I mean, I can show you this opinion tutor on my iPhone if you like. Mm -hmm. you know, it's really, I think it's kind of cool. So, so, so it's one, one program does everything. But, but yeah, you really would. To participate on that level, um, the other might be if, if in this area of language learning in the wild. That is, um, I mean, you even had some people at CMU say, yeah, I'd like to get involved. But again, the problem there is we need teacher buy-in. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I went, for example, to our English Language Institute, you know, and Alan Juffs, who's the, you know, the chairman of linguistics, is Alan. Yeah, but he has no control of the English Language Institute. You know, I went, so I go talk to those people and said, no, we don't want anything to change our curriculum, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, we got our curriculum and we just don't want to be decided. So, so that, that inflexibility makes, and you know, even people that want to, they say, well, we, you know, we need to get this into our curriculum by May because we have to, I mean, you know, even have to make my syllabus in June so that you'll do, you know, so, you know okay, that's possible, but, but it's a real inflexibility, I think, in a lot of courses, people really have a, which I understand, but, but, but yeah, boom, 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 and they're not learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I think adding to courses. Oh, I'm sorry. So, language learning in the wild might be possible even if, without putting in the. So, I don't know. That would be something we really should talk about because the um, a lot of the people. So, the people that are involved in that include people in Sweden, Denmark, a uh, few people actually in Hawaii. Um, so, so. We're, we're, you know, we have a lot of people who want to do the, this is a very different method where you actually go out and make recordings and interact with people and you think that ought to be easy but but yeah, you, you, you still need to kind of a, a, a funnel to, so that learners are coming in. Um, language uh, programs abroad would be the most obvious. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to try to look at this when I'm in, you know, in Taipei but in the spring, that would be a good possibility but why not language learners here in New York, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, there's so much you could be doing. Uh, you know, uh, have them go to MoMA and uh, talk to them. Well, maybe MoMA's so busy it's hard to do, but maybe some museum that is not so, you know, uh, stressed. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or even just talking to people, you know, in, in a gelato shop when off hours. You know, that's the way it was done in Iceland. It was this lady just goes into a bakery and starts talking with people when, when they're not, make, you know, selling bread. You know, and they're and, and they could teach, talk English, but for fun they're talking Icelandic, and uh, it's it's just you know it's, it's really great. You know, so that would be, I, I mean, I think that was only a beginning, but you know there are ways of doing this uh, that that we, so that would be that's not really experimental, but it d does gather great data. You know. Can I add on something? Yeah, please. Do you mind um, elaborating on what the project that you're going to be doing in Taipei? Well, the, the people in Taipei are at the, uh, I always forget the name of this, is the N NCTU, the National, the NTCU, National Taiwan. Normal University. It's teachers, Tom. It's basically yeah. it's teachers, yeah. NTNU. Yeah, and, and, and say? NTNU. NTNU. And I, I don't know why I put it as the NTNU, right? Normal University, yeah. And uh, they've been doing, you know, Chinese as a second language for a, a long time, actually. And you know, they have some materials that are okay, but they're really old style call, in my opinion. So I basically go in and just, we, they've, they've, they have a, a program, you know, from Abed Tseng, who used to be the education minister there. Uh, and, you know, Abed is his English name, I don't know, Tseng. Uh, but he uh, and some other people there, uh, Jun Lei, uh, some other, and, and actually some child language people, uh, did set up a program with Penn State. And Ping Lee is in that program and sort of brought me along. So it's really Ping and me and, and, and them are trying to both experiments but also really individual differences. Uh, this whole, whole idea, you know, uh, I don't know, they, they've got programmers, but they've been doing a lot of Second Life stuff. And Second Life is very clunky, I think. I don't like it. So we're trying to, I, I basically I'm going to go there and hope that we can do better. I mean, I'm not going to push them, but, you know, if they, if they have ideas, uh, hopefully, you know, I, and they, they have, of course, they want to do a lot of experiments and a lot of ERP stuff, which is good, you know, that's nice. But um, I, I think that they really, we need to, if they've got a lot of energy and a lot of resources, but they really should, I want to see them move in the more and more of this sort of more modern direction, really. In, in pedagogy, in terms of, that, have you looked at their pedagogy? Did you see it? Yeah, I and mean, you could go online and see it, and it's, yeah, it's kind of, you know, like almost like uh, not Prentice Hall, but what's the big book company that has all the you know online language learning? Uh, Pearson. Pearson, yeah, Pearson. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like Pearson. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, um, this is now the end of the, uh, this um, interview, but uh, I would like to conclude with a question that we really like to ask mm -hmm. all of our Apple speakers. Okay. If you have some general advice uh, for students who are currently working on research papers, who are working on their thesis or dissertations, or even future researchers who want to really uh, commit to this field, what kind of advice would you give us? Yeah, well, I would say, um, at this point, don't study fluency, it's too hard. <laughs> uh, leave that to me. Um, we'll, we'll, we're we're going to work on that. We're gonna, it, it, it takes too much work to, with current technology, um, the, the marking of pauses and retraces. I mean, it's a fascinating subject, of course. Uh, but you, you, if you do fluency, do it in a very controlled, um, you know, minimalist way. Um, but I do think that implicit explicit is pr still right for a lot of, uh, of, you know, you can really show explicit um, as, as way better than implicit. Um, and, and people will, I think, understand that. Um, there is a lot of, um, shall I say, entrenched a belief in the field that implicit somehow is, is the real way and, and explicit is not teaching you what you really need, uh, you, won't, you won't transfer, and, and I think that would be nice to kind of continue to push against that. Um, uh, but you'll still get published, it's, you know, they'll just give you a hard time. Um, I, I guess, um, I, I guess those, that would be, you know, I, don't, I, I would not touch, to me, motivation and individual differences unless you have better measures. You know, I, 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 I would not work on motivation right now. Uh, but individual differences, yeah. So there is probably a lot that can be done. If you, if, if you hook up with psycholinguists, I think, on individual differences, that would be a great direction. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, as I say, auditory. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot not going on there. But some of the other, I mean, I mentioned some of that. Um, I wasn't really prepared for that question. I don't know. You gave me, I, I guess you, it was it on the list, but, but you yeah, know, um, I, 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 I do, you know. Um, yeah, ERP, people do, do like ERP studies. I don't know if we, you know, I think they'll get published, so that's great. Um, you know, we can definitely show all this transfer. So that stuff I did with Natasha Tokovitz and then, you know, um, uh, uh, well, a lot of other people have picked up. Uh, Oscar Howe has done some of this. Um, I think you could show transfer so easily in ERP, you know, to, to interlanguage effects. So that that isn't a bad area, really. Not not bad at all. And if you assume you have an ERP lab, and it's not that expensive to get people in. Uh, it's a lot of work, you know, to analyze. But but that that that's pretty solid stuff, I think. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, that, I mean, really honestly, I could probably come up with five more areas, but it would take me some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We yeah. look forward to um, yeah, sure. listening to your talks in the afternoon. Okay, great. great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Yeah. You've given us a lot of people. Yes, okay. yes. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about it. But like this last question, maybe we can follow that up a little bit more later. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to ask me about my feelings about New York or who I was going to vote for or something Which Sanders. <laughs> that, that Sanders Clinton thing is really interesting here because Clinton won, but there was so much Sanders support. Huh? Oh, yeah. So Especially that, on campus. Yeah, on yeah, campus. So, on. so, you know, I, I definitely sympathize with all that. It's yeah. you know, understandable given all that's happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Now the fun part lunch. <laughs>